Peace. <coughs> we are studying this morning Parashat Pinehas. Our Parasha is actually the sequel of the end of last week's Parasha where we read of a tragic episode how the Jewish people was seduced by non-Jewish women and unfortunately they fell into promiscuous behavior and it was even worse than that one of the tribal leaders a fellow by the name of Zimri ben Salu he went and also committed uh, the sin he took a girl by the name of Kozbi Batsur she was a princess she was a Goya we're not going to discuss today what possessed Zimri to do such a cardinal crime. To take a Goya and he was with her and he did it in public and he did it, it seems, in spite and anger. That's a class in itself. What's the psychology behind this fellow Zimri to do such a, uh, such a grievous crime? In any event, God was very upset with the people, as you could imagine. There was a plague that ensued. 24,000 people died in that plague. That's a massive uh, destruction of life because of the sins. And it would have continued on. There was no reason for it to stop until a great man by the name of Pinehas, which is the name of the parasha, he came along and he said, I have to do something drastic. And he took his Roma, his spear, and he went into the camp where this fellow Zimri, this tribal leader, the leader of Shimon, was in the middle of the act with Kozbi. And he went and he took his sword and he put the dagger through both of them and he killed them. And it says after he did such an act, the plague stopped. Which means Pinehas succeeded to quell the anger of God. Which means he did a good thing. He did a mitzvah. He did a positive thing. Which means he, he saved the rest of the Jewish people from a plague that would have attacked all of them. So Pinehas goes down to become one of our heroes. It's a zikhut to have a parasha named after you. Pinehas is a special man. So when the, our parasha begins, it says, Vaydaber Adonai Moshe Lemor, Pinehas ben El Azar ben Aharon Kohen. Our Torah takes great length to tell us who the lineage of Pinehas was. Who is this man, Pinehas? Who was his father? Who was his grandfather? It says, Ben El Azar ben Aharon. His father's name was El Azar. His grandfather was Aharon, meaning he's a grandson of Aharon Kohen. The Kohen Gadol is his grandson. So I saw an order Haim Kadosh of Haim ben Atar. He says, Why does the Torah deem it necessary to tell us his lineage? He did a good deed. Tell us his name. Why do you have to mention his father and his grandfather? So he says a very important principle that we all must remember. Anytime we act and we commit a good deed, or God forbid, the opposite, you must know that our actions are a direct reflection on where we come from. It speaks not only about ourselves, but it speaks to the people who our father and mother are and who our grandparents are. And therefore, as people, we always have to remember we're not representing ourselves. Our deeds are going to directly affect the opinion that people have of our parents and our grandparents. The Gebara says, for example, when a young man or young girl acts in a proper way, what do the people say about them? <laughs> Fortunate are the parents of this child that are so lucky they taught this child Torah, it's to their credit. Our actions are to the credit of our parents. And therefore, when we talk about respect for parents, respecting parents doesn't only mean when you're in front of them. 
doesn't only mean when you're uh, uh, dealing with them on a one-to-one -one basis. Respecting parents means our conduct on the street. Because based on the way we conduct ourselves, people are going to say, wow, so-and-so has such beautiful children. That's respecting our parents. Because we're putting them in a good light. And therefore the Torah goes out of its way to say, Pinehas, you didn't act alone. You are ben El Azar, ben Aharon Kohen. This is the credit of your father and the credit of your grandfather. So really he did a double mitzvah. Number one, he stopped the plague, but he also was involved in giving a good name to his lineage. This is respect. And I want you to know, many people think that when we talk about respecting parents, this is only when they're alive. Well, certainly when they're alive, we have a great overriding responsibility to respect them. But respecting parents goes even beyond life. A child through his good deeds in this world is able to elevate the soul of his deceased parents or grandparents in the next world. Which means on a monthly basis or yearly basis, whatever opinion you're going to hold by, they open up the books on the deceased let's say from year to year, and they recalculate the deceased's mitzvot and averot. So somebody asked a good question, what do you mean recalculate? They can't do any mitzvot when they're in heaven. There's nothing to recalculate. The game is over. And the explanation is, the calculation is based on their children and grandchildren. Which means, Borei Olam says, what did you leave in this world? You left your descendants. If your descendants are going in the way of God, that's to your credit. And therefore you are now elevated. Hence, it is possible to do mitzvot after one's death, but not directly, through the children and the grandchildren. And therefore one rabbi said in the Gemara actually, that respecting of parents is even greater after they're gone. Because when they're alive, you can only benefit them physically. You can get them something to eat or drink, you can clothe them, you can bring them to a doctor, you can tend to their physical needs. But after they're deceased, now already you're able to benefit them spiritually. Now through your good deeds, you're able to elevate their souls. That's the ultimate kindness and goodness that a child can do. Like the Gemara says, The son, in this case the daughter as well, can benefit the parent, and that's why the Torah goes out of its way and says, Pinehas ben El Azar ben Aaron Kohen. Pinehas didn't do his action in a vacuum. He does not act alone. His action is a direct result of who his father is and who his grandfather is, and they get credit as well for producing such a child that was able to do such a great deed. Our Torah continues. Pinehas himself is referred to as a kanai. In English, the way they explain a kanai, it's a zealot. What does it mean, a zealot? And a zealotry for everybody. It seems Pinehas, when he saw this action, he was so upset. How could somebody go against God so blatantly? It's one thing a person commits a sin in hiding in his house, he closes the lights, nobody sees, God sees of course, but at least he does it with little shame. This man Zimri, he went with such chutzpah, in the wide open in front of everybody, broad daylight in front of the people, he takes a zonan, he goes with it, he's proud. Pinehas was so infuriated that he went and he killed him. Now, this is an act of zealotry. It's almost as if he took the law in his own hands. He didn't go to court, no betty, no nothing. He did it on his own. To be a zealot is not easy. As a matter of fact, we have a rule when it comes to zealotry. And you must know this rule. You must be 101% L'Shem Shamayim. To commit an act of zealotry, you must be very careful that you have no ulterior motives. That you are 100% driven for the sake of God and nothing else. 
You have no feelings of personal hatred, personal revenge, animosity. And therefore, I think that answers a question, is zealotry for everybody? Certainly not. One in a million maybe is able to be a zealot. And as a matter of fact, even after Pinehas did what he did, the people said he was wrong, it's haram what he did. He has no right to do such a thing. Only after God came along and said, he's good, he's legitimate, leave him alone. Only God who can test the heart of a man to see how pure he is, God was saying, yes, Pinehas, he did it 100% for the sake of God. There was no, no additives, no preservatives, no trimmings, no nothing. He did it for the sake of Hashem 100%. This is a rarity. This is <coughs> very difficult to find. <clears throat> but I learned a lesson from this. I learned a lesson <clears throat> that in life, the Gemara tells us there's certain people. They're from the category that the Gemara says, Osim ma'ase zimri umivakshim sakhar kepinehas. They act like zimri does and they want reward like pinehas. They do the malicious actions like zimri and then they come along and they ask reward. They want reward because God rewarded pinehas with great, uh, great uh, honor. So I never understood this Gemara. You know, who's the type of person who could do such an act like Zimri, it's such a promiscuous ask and ask for reward like Pinahaz? What does this mean? So maybe the Gemara means like this. <clears throat> there are certain people that, how should I say this? They act very piously. They put on a facade of religiosity of religious observance, of commitment. And for this loyalty, they demand reward. But they're doing it for ulterior motives. They're not l'shem shamayim. They're not doing it for the sake of God. The religion is used by them as a tool in order to garner respect, or honor, or praise, or acceptance. So this is what the Gemara means. There are certain people that it looks like they're doing a good deed, but really the act is like the act of Zimri. They're doing something for the wrong intentions. They're doing something that's misguided, but they want reward for it. I'll give you an example from the Tanakh. We read about Paro. Paro, it says, made a decree against the boys in Egypt. But the Pasuk says, But all made a royal order. Well, I want you to kill all the boys, but keep all the girls alive. Now, at first glance, you say, well, Paro has a little humanistic side to him. At least he doesn't want to punish the girls. And he can justify why he wants to kill the boys. You want to kill the boys because we, had a, we saw in our stars that the Jewish Savior is going to be born, so it's really in self-defense. We're just protecting our nation. Yeah, we can justify it in some way. And then he comes along and says, listen, you know, I'm a decent human being. What did the innocent uh, woman do? You know, if you want to pick on a fight, you don't pick on a girl. The girls have nothing to do with it. If you remember in the, in the old books, the biggest villains, they couldn't tolerate it. If somebody would say a curse word to a girl, oh, that, you, we don't talk to girls like that. You're a villain, you kill people all day long. No, but it's to the, to the girl, to the woman. That was Paro, he wants to put on a facade. Look, I'm a sadiq, look, I fulfilled the Geneva, the Geneva conditions, the Geneva laws of war. Leave the innocent uh, woman. He puts on the facade, he's a very pious man. You know what the rabbis tell us why he kept the Jewish girls alive? In order that he could commit zenut with them. In order that Ibn Manani can fulfill his base desires, him and his people, so they can involve themselves in immodest behavior. So this already, but only God knows the intent. It looks like he's doing something that's noble, but really there's a sinister plot behind it. Really he has negative intent. We must be careful from this type of behavior. We must be careful from giving one impression, but our intent is yet something else. A person might be very careful 
on certain standards because he could boast about it. Oh, I'm, I'm careful when it comes to not eating this type of food. I, don't, I only eat halab Yisrael. That's a beautiful thing. Everybody should adopt this practice. But when you use the mitzvot in order to elevate yourself, so not, you're not serving God anymore. You're serving yourself. It's self-serving. Using the mitzvot to advance yourself. One of the fellows came into the synagogue one morning and he's yawning and he's all sorts of tired and things like that. So they, to the people tell him, you look very tired. So he says, yeah, waking up every night at 12 o'clock, learning all night. <laughs> this you don't talk about. <laughs> what are you talking? You're saying it too loud that people can hear it. This is supposed to be private between you and God. Ah, so you're using the religion in order to... Then everybody say, oh, what a Sadiq, what a Hasid, you're so special. The Torah is telling us over here that our religious observant must be consistent. We shouldn't be religious because what people are going to say about us. We shouldn't do things because now the rabbi says, oh, you're so good. I said, now the rabbi accepted me, or my friends accepted me, or now I could boast to my circle and say, I also do this. That's why you're serving God. You serve God for God, not for ulterior motives. Not for any other reason, because God told you to do so. This is the subject of Pinehas, that he was 100% Hashem Shamayim. If we go further in our parasha, we read about the appointment of Yeshua. Moshe Rabbeinu was told by God that he's going to die and he needs to appoint a leader for the next generation. This is a very difficult decision for Moshe. Hakamim tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu looked at his own children and he felt that his own children were worthy to succeed him. God said, I'm sorry Moshe, your children will not succeed you. They're not you, they cannot fill your shoes. So Moshe says, then who is the one that's going to succeed me? He says, your student, Yoshua bin Nun. He is the one that's worthy to follow you. Now just as a side point, I want you to know, if Moshe Rabbeinu deemed his children worthy, they must have been very worthy people. Don't think that Moshe Rabbeinu was just like a father trying to protect the family business to pass it over to his sons. If Moshe Rabbeinu felt that his children were really worthy, must be they were great tzaddikim, and they definitely had tremendous ability, but that being said, God told them, no, it's not, they're not going to go to your children. We're not going to pass down the uh, baton of leadership to your sons. It goes to Yoshua. So I want to quote you a Midrash and give you an interpretation to the Midrash. The Midrash says like this. There's nothing that is more endearing in front of God Almighty than those people that go out and do mitzvot. Those people that are sent out on a mission to do a mitzvah. Whatever the mitzvah may be. Not only does he go out on a mission to do a good deed, but he gives his life. He does it what we call bimsinut nefesh. He sacrifices to get the job done. So then the Midrash goes on and says, the Midrash says, who is the classic example of people that went on a mitzvah mission and they were willing to sacrifice at all costs that the mission succeed? The paradigm example is the spies that Yehoshua sent to spy out the land of Israel. And who were those two spies? Pinehas and Kalev. So first of all, you see, just as a side point again, Pinehas is not only famous for what he did in this week's Pinehas, but Pinehas has a good resume. Pinehas was one of the spies that went into Israel to spy out the land. Him and Kalev. Well, Kalev already was a seasoned spy. He was already on the first expedition. He went with the 12 spies, and he got a second chance to go in. So the Midrash is telling us these two spies were unbelievable. They were commissioned to do a mitzvah, 
And they did it and they risked their lives. You have to know that. When they entered Eris Canal and they got caught the minute they got in, it seems that the border police was very strong in Eris Canal. They had very good uh, border patrol. The moment they penetrated the border, Kalev and Pinehas, already the police were on to them. They had to run. They actually ran to a certain lady. She was called Rahaba Zona, and she accepted them. And she hid them. The police came to the Hab's house. Did you see any spies? She says, oh, no, I didn't see him. Maybe they went that way. And she decoyed them and she sent the police on a wild goose chase in the wrong direction. And she harbored the spies. But it means they sacrificed their lives. They almost died because of it. So the Kemara says, this is a classic example of people that are told to do a mitzvah and they did it at all costs, even at their life expense. <coughs> but I saw another interpretation from Rav Zaychik, that he explains what was the sacrifice that they made. What a lesson it is. What is a lesson in, in character that he teaches us. He says like this, who were Kalev and Pinehas? Who were these two men? They were contemporaries of Yoshua. They were basically the same age. They were basically from the same generation. They were, call them friends. And they were all students of Moshe Rabbein. So they all were equal and they accepted the teachings of Moshe. When Moshe died, who became the new leader? Yoshua. You have to know human nature. Now all of a sudden Yoshua was one of their colleagues. He's one of their contemporaries. All of a sudden he comes and tells them, okay, you Kalev and you Pinehas, you go into Israel and go risk your life to spy out the land. Human nature is, hey listen, we don't have to take orders from you. You're, you're one of us over here. Who are you to tell us what to do over here? It's one thing when we were all in the same class with Rabbi Moshe. Uh, then already we all paid homage to Moshe Rabbeinu and we humbled ourselves. But you're going to tell us what to do over here, who are you? <laughs> you're one of the boys. And therefore human nature would be for them to say, we don't have to listen to you, go, go get somebody else to do your, uh, to your, do your dirty work, Yoshua. The greatness and the sacrifice that Kalev and Pinehas had was what? Humility. Now that Yoshua was the leader and God made him the, the chief, and he tells them to go spy out the land, we accept, and they did it loyally. And they didn't do it with any personal claims against them, they didn't do it with any negativity or cynicism, who's he to tell us what to do? All of a sudden he's deleted now, he's telling us to go into the land, we're wiser, we're smarter. The greatness of these two men was, they sacrificed their ego. And that's the biggest sacrifice that a person could do in the life. Very hard for a person to humble himself, to bow to somebody that might be younger than them or wiser than them. The greatness of these two men was they were totally effaced in front of Yoshua, even though logically he says they shouldn't have been. Logic says, you're not better than us, Yoshua. Hey, don't boss us around. You want to go start commissioning people to do your work? Go tell somebody else to do it over here. Where are you talking to us over here? We're in the same school. No, they said, God chose you as the leader of Israel, we accept. Let me tell you a story from the Zohar, so you can understand it a little clearer, maybe. The Zohar says, one time there was a rabbi, Rabbi Al-Azhar. He's the son of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, the great Kabbalist. This is Rabbi Al-Azhar. He once walks and he sees a, a fellow, a man. He stopped him, he said, what's your story? What do you do? He says, I came from a certain town, and I opened up the first yeshiva in the town. Wow, what is a chut? And what type of yeshiva? For children. And I used to take all the children of the town and I taught them Torah. He says, until what happened, came a great rabbi and moved to the town. Who was the rabbi? To be Yosef. When he came to the town, guess what he did? He opened up a yeshiva also. And he's a great teacher. And what did end up happening? All the students of my yeshiva, as well as the town, they all moved to the yeshiva of Rabbi Yosef. So Rabbi Al-Azhar says, and what did you do? He says, so I went to Rabbi Yosef and I asked him for a position if I could teach in his school. 
Wow, when Rabbi and Azar heard this, he went crazy. He said, you did that? I have to bring you to my father, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, for a blessing. What's the explanation over there? What was he impressed? You know what it means to get a blessing from Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai? He wrote the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. The holiest rabbi of the Talmud, of the Mishnah, Rabbi al Azad, you know how many people wanted blessings probably from the beach moment in your hide? It was probably a line from here to 100 miles to get a beracha. What did the school teacher have over everybody else that Rabbi al Azad says, You, you're worthy. Let's go. You got a beracha for my father. And the explanation is the humility. What's the normal reaction? Somebody comes in, more qualified than you, closes down your yeshiva. First of all, you're supposed, he's supposed to become your arch enemy, that man. Your competition. Look at this. Your teaching Torah came in and now he opened up his own place. He bankrupted your yeshiva. He took all your students. The normal nature is this guy. Who does he think he is? You get upset. You move to a different town. That's part of the course. And you open up a new yeshiva. That's it. That's what he's supposed to do. What does he do? He says, you know what? He's better than me. He's succeeding. He's teaching Torah. So let me humble myself, I'll go get a job and teach Torah, but maybe I'll learn some techniques from Rabbi Yosei, I'll become better. He says, what? You were able to humble yourself? You have no ego? You're not a human being. What a Musar. Where are we compared to these people? So many little things drive us and our, our, our arrogance. The smallest things, we get offended and we get upset and we have a grudge and we have animosity and we have revenge on silly things. Look at the great Hachem. I mean, where are we compared to these great giants? Pinehas and Kalev like pussycats in front of Yoshua. Yes, Yoshua. As if he's uh, greater than them. He wasn't greater than them. He's their colleague. You're in charge. With whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do. God says there's no greater messengers than Yoshua and, 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 and Kalev and Pinehas. There's a story told in the Gemara. You must know this story. I'm going to give it to you very quickly. I want to make one insight on it that's pertaining to what I just said. The Gemara says there was a president of the yeshiva of Yavne. This is after the destruction of the second temple. The rabbi's name was Rabban Gamliel. Oh, Rabban Gamliel was a giant of, of character, of stature. Great man, leader of Israel, Rabban Gamliel. For whatever reason, the rabbis in the Bet Midrash decided to depose him. Depose him meaning to take away his position. For whatever reason it was. Now the question was, who's going to replace Rabban Gamliel? After the, after the nominated president, he's the president. They said, well, Rabbi Akiva, no, he's not worthy. Who else we have on the list? Well, we have Rabbi Yoshua, nah, not worthy, not the right candidate. Oh, what about the Bil Azab bin Azariya? Oh, this is the Bil Azab bin Azariya. Unbelievable. They voted? Yes, he's the man to take over the place of uh, the Bil Rabbi Gabriel. Incidentally, the Gemara says the Bil Azab bin Azariya was 18 years old. And sure enough, they vote. They tell Rabbi Gabriel, you know, you're forced into retirement, and uh, the Bil Azab bin Azariya is going to take over your position. Good. What I would expect the Gemara to say at that point is the following. Rabban Gamliel said, fine, this is what you want to do to me. You're replacing me, I was the president for however many years. You're replacing me with a teenager, 18 years old. This is what a, what a busha, what a humiliation. I would expect the Gemara to say, I have no claims. That the Gamliel picked himself up. He said, boys, whoever wants to come with me, I'm opening up my own yeshiva across the street. And finished, I don't have to be humiliated like this. Boy has to go up to his wife and say, yeah, they, they threw me out. Who they replace you with? An 18-year-old, an 18-year-old. The Gemara says, on that day, Rabban <laughs> Rabban Gamliel did not leave the yeshiva or miss the proceedings that went on in the yeshiva that day even for one moment. The greatness of that line of the Gemara. The Gemara is saying, Rabban Gamliel, he accepted. He accepted. How could you see now somebody sitting in your chair? They deposed you, you see a young man sitting in your chair. Human nature would say, you know what? 
take the day off, Rabban Gimel, go home. Even if you're not going to open up your own yeshiva, go get an ice cream cone. Go, you know, relax. Do, take a walk on the boardwalk. Go away to Florida for a couple of days. Just to clear your mind. You just went through it. It's trauma <laughs> to get deposed and be replaced. It's only traumatic if you have an ego. It's only traumatic if you're, if you're self-inflated. But if you have no ego, what's the difference? The main thing is we have a president of the yeshiva, so I'm not worthy. So now we have to study. So he doesn't even walk out, he doesn't excuse himself, even for one moment, he doesn't miss the proceedings. Look at the great Achamim in the olden times. They were so pure, they were so l'shem shamayim. This is, speaks volumes to us and our behavior and our character. How far are we from these things? We get offended and we get slighted by the silliest things. We have enemies for life because somebody looked at us the wrong way or didn't invite us the right way or didn't call us at the right time. You know who I am? As great as we are, none of us are Pinehas, none of us are Kalev, none of us are Rabangam Liel, none of us are even on the level of that school teacher that can go to the B, you're saying, please do me a favor, do you have a job for me? What do you mean job? You were the first guy to open up the yeshiva. Yeah, I know, but uh, you're better than me. Can I work for you? Unbelievable. This is what we're talking about, humility. That we cannot hold ourselves in such a, such a high esteem. We have to let things slide off of us. Not to take things so to heart. Not to be so makpeed. Not to be so stringent on everything. This is the job of, of a Jew. We go further. In the Perasha itself, <clears throat> There is a listing of all, all the tribes and their children. There's like a census that was taken in this week's parasha as well. If I can make a few insights on this census. Specifically on the tribe of Yisachar. You know one of the tribes was Yisachar, you've heard of him, Yisachar, Zivulun, Yisachar is one of the sons of Le'ah. I don't want to get too technical, but it's important that you know, looking at the windows over here, if you see Yisachar's name, he's probably, his name is on one of the windows, probably towards the back. In any event, the way you spell Yisachar's name, the name is spelled Yud, and then there's a, a scene, and then another scene, and then a chaf and a resh. So really, it has two scenes. The real pronunciation of Yisachar's name should be Yisachar. As a matter of fact, there are some Ashkenazim that that's the way they pronounce Yisachar, Yisachar. They read it, they read every letter. We read it with a silent scene. We only pronounce one of them. So the Da'at Zikinim of the Ba'alit Tosafot asks, why the double scene? You know, what's the reason? So he gives two explanations. Let me give you both. It says, reason number one, the first scene stands for the word Sakhar. Sakhar means reward. When Leah had this son, she felt she was being rewarded. Every child is a gift from God, it's a reward. So therefore, she put that scene in his name to symbolize the word Sakhar, the reward. He's a prize, he's a trophy. The second scene, he says, comes from the Hebrew word liskor, to rent. Why? What's renting have to do with anything? So if you know the story how Yisachar was born, you remember Reuven <coughs> came back from the field one day and he had dudaim. Dudaim is a certain type of flower, maybe a jasmine. It's an aphrodisiac. It, it helps ladies conceive this flower. <clears throat> so when Rahel saw the flower, she says, oh, wow, these flowers, I can use them. She was barren at the time. She says, Listen, can I have these flowers? So Leah says, you want uh, these flowers? They belong to me. I'll make you a deal. I give you the flowers. You give me Yaakov for tonight. So there was like a, you forgive me, but this is what the Gemara says. She rented Yaakov. 
she, you take the flowers, I get Yaakov. So therefore, Yisach, and who's born out of, out of, as a result of that conception? Yisachar. So the second scene comes from the Hebrew words, Liskor, to rent, because uh, that's, that's how he came about. But it's not nice, it's Ayub. So then, but that scene is not pronounced. We don't want, it's a silent scene, because you don't want to say that too loud, that they rented Yaakov Avinu, this is not a nice thing to say. But it's there in the name, but you don't say it. That's the first interpretation. But I want to give you the second interpretation of the Tosaf. He says an amazing thing, I have to explain it to you. He says, one of the children of Yisachar, it's written in the Perasha, was a fellow called Yashuv. It's a name, not such a common name. His name was Yeshuv. Hakamim tell us that wasn't his original name, Yeshuv. But she brings it down. His original name was Yob. Yud Vav Bet, Yob. But what happened? It turns out later on there was a famous Avodah Zarah that they named Yob. So Yisachar says, uh, my son now is going to have the same name as uh, Abu Dazara. So therefore, what did he do? He changed his name to Yashuv. He added a sheen to his name. Oh, so it says, where did he get the sheen from? He took it from his own name. And therefore, he took a sheen from his name and gave it to his son. Therefore, we don't pronounce it because uh, he gave it away. Therefore, we say Yisachar, because technically he only has one sheen left in his name, because what he gave to his son for the name change. End of Midrash, end of, end of Tosafot. What bothered me in this Tosafot, which should bother you as well, it's a nice thing you made a name change. I have no claim against that. It's like, you know, God forbid, there's somebody named this kid uh, Yeshu, and all of a sudden, yeah, that becomes uh, JC. All of a sudden, his, his name turns out to be the, 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 the father of the Abu Dazara. So of course you got to change the name. The guy's going to walk around now with a name like that. But my question on this commentary is, do you want to change his name? Change his name. What do you have to donate one of your, your letters for? Which means we also make name changes in the synagogue. God forbid somebody's sick sometimes, so they add a name. What do you think? We make a, we make a, 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 a letter drive? Uh, ladies, we need a Zion. Anybody want to donate a Zion? Anybody want to donate a Vav? You change the name. When Yisachar says, I'm going to change the name, so I have to give him one of my letters. You know, he needs a sheen. It's like a Wheel of Fortune. He needs a sheen. So you can give him a sheen from, uh, from his name. What, what, what is the explanation over here? So I wanted to explain like this, with your permission. A great Musab. You're right. He could have gave him any old sheen. He could have taken a sheen from the box and put it in his son's name. But it's teaching you a lesson in parenting. That a parent has to be willing to give of himself, to sacrifice from himself to benefit the child. That sheen is not any old sheen. That comes from his father's name. The father's willing to take from my name, from my, give it to my child. The self-sacrifice that a parent has to have, even from him own self, he has to be willing to sacrifice. Yov is much better off because he got the sheen, not from Stam the alphabet, because he got it from his father. When a parent has self-sacrifice on the children, it's different. Yisachar is teaching us a great lesson, ladies. <coughs> We live in a very, very promiscuous generation. We live in a generation that there's a lot, lot of good that we have, but there's a lot to be envied as well in this generation. And unfortunately, one of the great crises of our generation is wayward children, children at risk. But we might redefine this problem at parents at risk. Because today, unfortunately, parenting has become not a priority in many families. Parenting has become a second or third importance. The first importance is seeking pleasure, of enjoying, of going out, of traveling, of socializing. And then, uh, of course, when we have some time to spend with the children as well. And therefore, the Torah is teaching us a great lesson. Great children only come from great parents. There's no coincidence. 
We cannot just treat our children like a roll of the dice and just hope that they come out. Okay, it takes great sacrifice on the parents. Yisachar is saying, I gave from my own name to the child. That's the level that we have to reach. But unfortunately today, it's parenting by proxy. I remember Allah Hashem, Acham Baruch, our master and teacher, whenever we would visit him, he would bemoan the fact that he would see the maids taking the children off the bus from the yeshiva. He said, you know what the Torah talks about, the zechut of Jewish mothers taking the children off the bus? This is zechut that's... How could you give it over to somebody else to do? And one rabbi said that in our community, Baruch Hashem, we have many farah, we should have many more. But the social obligations sometimes deny us from our first position. We didn't come in this world to go to farah. That's, a, that's gravy. We came into the world to raise our children. So he said a wedding invitation is not a summons. Which is a good point, which means in our community it's possible you can go out every single morning and every single night and it's going to be with the children. We have to go back to the old tradition of parenting our children, not by proxy, not through a shalia, with self-sacrifice. What does self-sacrifice mean? Self-sacrifice means that even though, let's say, for you, it's not a problem. But you have to take your children into consideration. For example, a parent takes children on vacation, an adult vacation. So the parents have a right to go on a vacation. They're married already, let's say they have no yetzirah, and everything's good with them, and they're fine, let's assume the best situation. So they, they, they earn their money honestly, they have rights, no, it's free world, free country, God bless America. But what? Is this a place where your children should be? Many parents are not willing to sacrifice from their own pleasure for the sake of their children. You're right, maybe you could be there, but your children have no right to be here. To bring children to a place where there's gambling, where there's drinking, where there's all sorts of lewdness. All right, so you're a parent, let's say you're old enough, you have your 18 years old, it says in the country, if you're 18 years old, you're allowed to do all these averot, let's say, according to the United States. It's not avon, let's say. God bless America again, they tell us that we have a different Torah. As long as you're 18 years old, you can become an Arab, do whatever you want. Okay, so you're 18, you're fine. But your children are not 18 years old yet. So how do we allow our children? Because why? we don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to sacrifice. That's a simple sacrifice. We're not willing to do it. I have vacation, I'm gone. But it's not for your children. It's kapara, what are you going to do? We'll guide them as well. Don't look, don't see, you can't go. You can't, don't look, don't see. This is a tremendous sacrifice that we have to have. We don't want to sacrifice basic things. It's come to my attention that even now, that Baruch Hashem, the community has in deal specifically, tremendous options that have been available to us that have not been available to us ever before for our children to socialize, which is a very important thing. Hacham Yaakov Katsina Lava Shalom always would speak about the importance of having venues where our children could meet in a kosher atmosphere with our community members. Not that they should have to go other places and Hatva Shalom come in contact with Goyim, which could lead to assimilation. This was the opinion of the Rabbi Acham Baruch as well. They always would position the community in a way where we could be insulated. And they always were like we're against having to go away. So Baruch Hashem, now in recent history, there have been venues that have opened up where our children can come together. At night, during the day, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And Bezat Hashem, man, much good will come out. But it's not wonderful when these venues are filled with drinking and alcoholism. It's unacceptable for parents to be with their children on a Sunday at a beach and with a father drinking a beer and holding a two-year-old and watching him in the swimming pool or in the ocean or things. This unacceptable behavior. It's one thing if parents want to go out at night and drink, have a little wine during dinner or go what they do in their own homes. But in public venues and days what we're spending with our children, so now that becomes the, we're not Irishmen, we're not alcoholics, where everything has to become around a drink and a drink. And I always felt it was very offensive that drinking has become so important, such an integral part of our community. 
that even now when somebody comes to a party of ours, right away the first thing before we say welcome, have a drink, have a drink. But this is already has become as if everybody has become addicted. That this is the greetings instead of saying Baruch Abba, Shalom Aleichem, right away have a drink. And I've said many times this has even infiltrated the bar mitzvahs. I made a joke this morning. I told the men. I said today a bar mitzvah. It's more bar than mitzvah. <laughs> You walk into the shul, you see a big bar, the thing is 30 feet by 30 feet on all sides. What are we talking about over here? Where, where, where have we gone? When we can only celebrate farah with this drinking and everybody has drink in their head and everybody's... But now it comes to another thing. If parents are not willing to have misidu nefes for their children, that's one thing. Maybe they're not willing to sacrifice any of their pleasures for their children. Okay, that's unfortunate. That's selfishness. They're not willing to do what's right for their children, even though it might take away from their own uh, pleasure. This is unfortunate. I told you I met a lady once when I was in Hong Kong from our community, and we were sitting together having lunch, and she said, no, Rabbi, I'm not eating today. You're not eating today? Why? Is it a fast day? She says, yes, I fast every Monday and Thursday. Monday and Thursday, a fast with Monday and Thursday. She embarrassed me, Monday and Thursday, for 20 years, for 20 years. Like she's wearing pants or nothing, not to 20 years, you're fasting Monday and Thursday. She says, yes. I said, for what? Can I, are you Baba Sali? Who are you? What are you? She says, for my children. For your children? That they should be healthy, they should marry correctly, they should have good derecheret, they should have... To, well, I don't believe what she's telling me over here. It's such a sacrifice. You're sacrificing your food, basic. You, what a mother won't do for a child. But unfortunately today, this is one in a million. But today it's even worse. Not only there's no sacrifice of personal life for the sake of the child. That means the mother has to be home and the father has to be home. And there has to be, you can't go there and you can't do this. And if this is not a proper thing to have in the house, even though you were allowed to have it, you have to get rid of it for the sake of the child. And all these things, basic. But now it's reckless. I don't have to tell you about the... Uh, the, uh, the law and the police that are involved in making sure that the town is protected. It's quite possible. A person can come here on a Sunday, drink, there's children in the car, but Madan. This is a terrible offense. What are we doing? Why do we always have to wake up but Madan after something happens? Why do we always have to wake up as, oh, you know, you're, it's a terrible thing. Why can't we ever be proactive on things? I mean, this is haram. We cannot let our members endanger not themselves and not their children. And don't think it doesn't happen. I'll tell you a story. I'm going to incriminate myself, but I have to tell you the story anyway. Last year in the summer, at about 5 o'clock in the morning, I was coming to synagogue. At Hataya Nima Skit Hayom. I was going 50 miles an hour on Lawrence Avenue. You have to know, ladies, at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's not too many cars on Lawrence Avenue. And there's a big yes, there's no traffic light, there's no kids riding on their bicycles. So I want to get to shul, I want to get to city hall. Sure enough, there was a cop right there. He stopped me. Now I'm stuck. I'm, you're going 30 miles over the speed limit. I told him, I'm Rabbi Mansour. It doesn't matter. The tapes, the CDs, that the, the doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So anyway, they gave me a court date. So I had to come to court. This is already in, let's say, December. I had to appear in court, so I came to Roselle, to the courthouse. For some reason, the court was closed that day. Maybe they were changing a light bulb. I don't know what they were doing. So everybody had to go to Allenhurst uh, instead. So we came to Allenhurst. To my shock, I wasn't the only Syrian in the courthouse that morning. <laughs> but to their shock that they saw Rabbi Mansour walk into the courthouse, so now everybody's coming to me, Rabbi, I wasn't speeding, I'm just here for this. Another lady comes to me, I, I always wear my seatbelt. So I'm not the judge, I'm, not, I'm here for my own uh, wajara. So you don't, have to, you don't have to answer to me, I'm not, uh, I'm not looking at you funny, do whatever you, you know. So I have my own headaches here today. In any event, what happened was, I was ha happy to be from the last people. Uh, that went up in front of the judge, which, thank God, he exonerated me, he gave me a, a, a pass for one time. But many of the cases before me were drunk driving cases, which means youth, 
men, ladies that had to stand in front of a judge that were caught, and when were they caught? August 10th, July 4th, July 16th. And these were all being standing in front of a judge because they were driving when they were drinking. And they weren't drunk, these people. But a little drink here and there, and they endangered the lives of the passengers in the car. You should have heard the judge, what a Musad he was giving them. What are you people, crazy? Uh, what's the next case? Oh, more drunk driving. And this is only, I was there one morning. Which means, must be that these tickets are being given out. We don't know. They don't talk, nobody boasts about it. Nobody goes around bringing, they got a ticket for DWI. But this is a very dangerous thing. So at what, what expense, what expense? If we're not willing to protect ourselves, but for the sake of our children, and what type of message are we giving our children when they see that all our pledges can only be with... Now there's one thing what a person does in his house, we're not coming to talk about what a person, a person wants to have Shabbat, wants to enjoy himself, it's in the house. Rabbis are not going to come now like Big Brother now and go put the, the satellite the, the cameras in everybody's house and start to, to dictate. This is in a public venue. This is much different. This is a community sponsored uh, 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 events, which, are, which listen to what I'm telling you so you don't misinterpret me. These are good events. These are things that a lot of good can come out of. A lot of, a lot of positive can come from these things. But why does it have to be with a negative? Why does it have to be with that element where it's, it's, not, our, it's not our class, it's not our, it's not our level. Am Yisrael's Kiddushin. We don't have to stoop to this level, especially in front of our children. What, the, what are we teaching them? Today they told me that now the, the, the new Hag is, the, the, the boys, they go to the weddings, so now there's new strictness. Can't give them anything to drink because they're not 18. So they take $20, they give it to the waiter, do me a favor. For $20, they'll do anything for you. If it's $20, it's, you own him. Now the whole night, what's going on? Well, where does this come from? Where does this come from? Where does this lax attitude towards alcohol come from? Because since this became the Minhag in the community, that everything has to be around a drink and uh, 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 inebriating oneself. Yes, I agree. Does the Torah have Purim? Yes, but it's not Purim every day. Put him once a year, a person in his house wants to drink a little bismillah, or, or, or authorized drinking, of course, Shabbat, okay, it's authorized in his house, it's done with a normal way. But it's not talking about over here where we're endangering people's lives. All you need, Badminnan, is one story, and it won't happen, it won't happen. But all you need is one story of Badminnan, one accident, of one mishap, you know, that everybody wakes up and says, oh, what are we doing over here? How do we allow this to happen? Well, what do you have to wait till something happens? It's not going to happen. What do you have to wait? Community has to wake up. Who am I talking to over this? Everybody says, I know everybody's thinks. So I was talking about Rabbi, we're the good people. We came to the class. Who are you screaming at? What are you yelling at? We're, we're the righteous ladies that came to class on Friday. Go go to the beach and speak to us over here. I'm not a member, so they won't let me in. <laughs> but I speak over here, so then you go and you go and, and, you, and, you, and you, spread the, you spread the message. In any event, that's what the Torah is telling us. Yisachar had two sheens, but you only pronounce one of them. Why? Because one of them he gave to his child. He changed his son from Yov to Yashuv because he knew that this scene is not a regular. It's coming from a father to a son, the sacrifice that a parent I mean, Yashuv is much better off because he got that self-sacrifice of his father. And Bezat Hashem, if we can continue in the traditions of our grandparents and great-grandparents, that their children were their priority. Nothing was more important to them than their children. They dreamt about their children and they were concerned about them, and they sacrificed some of their lives, whether it was working or whether it was their pleasures, and then Bezat Hashem will continue to have berachan, prosperity. Dor yesharim yevorach, v'chol banayich l'modei Adonai, v'rab shalom banayich, amen v'amen.